Okay, so developing your style as a photographer. What we're gonna do today is wrap this up a little bit and I have some stuff to show you. And um, there's a really cool lesson involved today that I'm pretty excited about. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And uh, let's see, um, we'll go ahead and get going. Sorry, something's floating through the air here. Um, okay, so developing your style as a photographer. This is part four, I believe, and in our series. And uh, you know, just to recap a little bit, I'm gonna come back and recap later because this will be the last show that we do on this uh, particular subject uh, for now. Uh, I think there could be some more stuff that we do later. Um, and this is, I want you guys to remember, this is an ongoing process. This is something that you get better and better and better and better at, and I think hopefully one day you get really good at, um, but it never stops, remember that. And I've tried to design this course with the exercises that we've talked about and keeping a notebook and all that stuff in a way that uh, you can kind of come back to these things. And personally, I've found you know, we all get busy in life, whether it be, uh, you know, in taking photos or, or day jobs or whatever it is, family ob obligations, um, you know, and sometimes you get out of practice with some of this stuff and you feel like you need to come back. And so these exercises are designed so they're really, they can be independent of one another um, or, you know, they can be standalone, obviously, or they can fit together. So, you know, you could hopefully revisit this class in the future if you wanted or, or you know, take notes and revisit what, what it is you've been working on. So anyway, um, that being said, today, um, one thing I've been very careful about with all these exercises, and you've probably noticed this as if you've, if you've gone through and done any of these, is that uh, you know there's an expression, you don't want to put the cart before the horse, right? You want to make sure the horse is before the cart. And so we've done things like actually going and sitting and thinking um, and actually uh, you know, not having a camera there and forcing yourself into kind of this mode of thought. Um, where you're really learning to think before you shoot. And I think that's the important takeaway here. Um, and that is really important, is, is, is that kind of sensibility. Um, photographs do not come from the camera, they come from your mind, they come from your talent, your skill level, your experience, your sense of creativity. Um, you know, for instance, I heard somebody say the other day, you know, they were doing a commercial job and it went really quickly. They did some portraits and they got them done in like, you know, 15 minutes. And, you know, the client made a comment and said, wow, 15 minutes, that's really quick. And this friend of mine said, well, it didn't really take 15 minutes. It took 15 years and 15 minutes. And you hear people say that a lot. And I think that's true because, you know, what you are as a photographer is a sum of all of your experiences and, you know, everything you've done to this point. That's what, you know, comprises your skill level. So anyway, that being said, um, you know, we've been very careful in each one of these exercises to kind of make sure that thought process is coming first. And in the exercise I'm going to show you today, we're going to talk about storytelling and uh, more literal than what we talked about in the last one. And this is really important to get your camera out and take a bunch of photos. This is kind of a little bit different exercise because that is encouraged in this. So anyway, uh, last time we talked a little bit about photographic, well, actually the last couple times we've talked about photographic meditation and where you take a subject and you try to get it from as many angles as possible. And what we're doing when we do this is you're trying to expand your um, sensibilities or your approach in terms of things like aesthetic, composition, um, lighting, mood, all those things that, that really will help your, your personal style as a photographer. And forcing yourself into a meditative state of doing that will help with those things. Uh, because what'll happen is meditation, you're going to go for a long time. So whether that be 45 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever, all day. Uh, you're going to exhaust your common, like in, in music, if you play guitar, you're gonna exhaust all your licks pretty quick. You know, all the stuff that you play all the time. And it's gonna force you to start doing new things and not just repeating the same thing over and over. And that's really important. And and so we talked about doing that and then we talked about <coughs> being able to capture a mood, a feeling, an emotion um, and being able to communicate that in a still image. And we're going to expand upon that a little bit today and what we're going to talk about is actually storytelling in a more literal sense. Now if, I don't know how many people in the chat room, I found that it's, it's usually you know, really divided um, with with show audiences like this. Uh, you know, obviously we have the, kind of this convergence idea now of uh, being able to shoot video on still cameras. And I don't know how many people actually shoot video on still cameras, I do. I know that, like for me when I'm doing it, it they're, they're two completely different things. It's not like you're just gonna flip back and forth between doing video and still. I mean, you could do that, but video requires a little more setup, a little more thought. It's different than doing still images. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about storytelling kind of like what you would do with, with video, where you're actually gonna have scenes that go across, but we're gonna do it with still images. And if you've ever done film production, 
and you've ever done anything with storyboarding. That's a lot like what we're talking about today. And so the idea is you're gonna do a series of images. So this could be, um, uh, in, in fact, when you start out, you can do as many images as you want. Um, uh, oh, real quick, Bob uh, has mentioned, Bob K815 has mentioned in the chat, um, uh, yes, I have tried and the audio limitations make it more troubled than actually using a quality video camera. Absolutely. I mean, there's, I'm not going to go into this whole video versus thing, but I just wanted to make the point that uh, what we're doing is we're, we are doing still images. We're not shooting video, but we're going to um, do it with more of a cinematography approach to use a really weird word for that. But anyway, it's a, you know, uh, it's a cinema type approach that we're using this. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a series of images and you're gonna tell a story with these images. Now I've actually already done this exercise and I'm going to share it with you today uh, in this, this thing. But before I get going, I wanna kinda describe what we're doing. So what you're gonna do is take a, um, you're gonna tell, tell a story. So you wanna kinda come up with something. And we'll talk about kinda ideas that you can come up with on something like this and how complicated it needs to be. Um, I would start by just doing lots of stuff. So I wouldn't make them very complicated. I wouldn't write novels and try to you know, execute them, even though maybe you could think of a scene with two people and you could actually do it. Um, the one I actually did this morning is uh, I made soft boiled eggs for breakfast. And so I documented that process. And I'll, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. They're not great images, but uh, that's not the point here. The point is, is are they telling a story as they go? And so in, in, when you do film, whether you do documentary stuff, uh, even TV commercials, if you do, uh, you know, particularly movies, there's a technique called storyboarding. And what storyboarding allows you to do is kind of figure out what the scenes are going to be. And so typically you can take a blank sheet of paper, you can draw them, you can use a camera and go photograph things, which is kind of like what we're doing here. And you go through and you basically, it's to, it serves the point to make sure that you're telling that story and what it's going to sort of look like hopefully when you're done uh, gives you that sense um, and it also uh, begins to a little bit think about composition um, <coughs> especially if there is compositional techniques they're going to assist in that story for instance if you are Alfred Hitchcock and you're making a movie like Vertigo and there's scenes that you're trying to express this fear of height or Psycho where it's, you know, this woman checks into a motel and she's in the, like the famous shower scene. Well, the shower scene wasn't just like improvised. I mean, that was really thought out and probably storyboarded uh, where you actually think of sharp camera angles that are going to intensify what you're trying to communicate in that scene. And so that's kind of what we're doing with this. What we're gonna, but we're, we're telling a story. And so the story could be something just extremely uh, basic and simple. Like for instance, I, I, I did a little story of myself cooking breakfast this morning. It can be that easy. These, uh, for instance, that that's a weird topic, but I wanted to do something and I needed to do it today to show you. Um, but the story isn't the point as much as am I telling it? You know what I'm saying? So for instance, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of went with it with the mode of, okay, let's say somebody doesn't know how to soft boil an egg. What are the steps involved? And you're telling this with pictures and not with words. And I think that's kind of key here um, to mention. Um, a photographer that I knew years ago who is no longer with us, but uh, uh, he, this guy he was considerably a couple years older than my, I am and I looked up to him, he was a mentor of mine. And he, he, I remember we, when we were, I was helping him, we were working on his first website. He wanted to do the whole thing with no text at all. Now this was the early days of the web where you know, people would do these entire things in Flash and that's what we did. But I always thought that was a cool idea, especially as a photographer, is being able to communicate with images and pictures and not with words. So it's nonverbal communication, which really is exactly what we're doing. So if you're do this exercise what I would do is is shoot freely and edit later okay so what you want to do is be thinking about okay what what are the steps in here that are essential to telling the story or in my case cooking breakfast here but what are the steps that are essential to that and then you go back through and you call out things that are non essential so for instance when I was cooking it's kind of hard to cook and shoot at the same time because you don't want to overcook things but um, I ended up probably with about 30 images and I've narrowed it down to nine. Okay, so that's where that editing comes in and you're going to actually go through these and decide what are the key points, what's essential. Okay, so I served my soft boiled egg on toast and I actually had shots of the toaster and the toast being made. Well, I kind of thought that's probably not essential because the point of what I'm trying to communicate is how to soft boil an egg, not how to get into cooking toast. I assume people probably know how to make toast, particularly with a toaster. Um, there's not a lot of exciting steps involved there. Um, so anyway, let me show you what I've got here. And what I'm gonna do, I need to minimize a couple windows here. And uh, sorry, let's see, I need to bring this down. Oh, and we are having freezing issues. This is great. All right. Can you guys still hear me in the chat? Okay, it's done froze. All right, good. Gotta love 
live video on a budget. Okay, so I'm going to collapse that window. And let's go ahead and open these. And now what I'll do is show you the desktop. Um, so we'll flip over to that. Okay, you guys should see my desktop here so I can show you. In the future, I will find a much smoother way of getting this done. Let me just check and make sure that this is on. And yes, it is. Okay, so this may be hard to see and I will blow these up. But okay, so we have, I'll go through these. First of all, let's look at the thumbnail view. And I know it's, it, it may be stretching if you're on the live broadcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, I'll have it sorted out by the time it releases. But we have nine images here that basically tell the story of making a soft boiled egg. And uh, you know, obviously you start with two eggs in the upper left hand corner. Uh, you get some water boiling, which is the second image. Third image is the time to set them, which uh, when you blow this up, you'll be able to see it's four minutes uh, on my stove. And next image you see dropping the eggs into the boiling water and then finally rinsing the eggs, cutting them with a knife, how to peel. They're on the toast in the eighth image. And finally you see some broken eggshells in image number nine. Now, I'll kind of talk you through this. This was done in a hurry, obviously, and it was just to illustrate the point. And I think this is the important takeaway here, that these nine images are designed by myself to go as a set of images, okay? So they're not, um, the idea is not to make each one of them uh, stand on its own at this point. So these are go going to go together in a set. And you can see, as you tell this progressive story here that's going along here, and in this case, uh, you know, how to soft boil an egg, that if you're successful in that, things like the aesthetic, uh, especially um, if you get, there's a lot of photographers that get really over obsessed with counting pixels and how many megapixels they have and how sharp it is and how, well, you know, fractions of the lens and things like that. None of that really makes a bit of important difference when you have told a story correctly. All those things are a lot less important. If, in fact, some of them are not important at all if you've done it correctly. Uh, and I think that's the important thing to take away here. Um, if it was all about modern lenses and digital cameras, then well, we can ignore, you know, the pretty much the history of photography before 1990 or so, which wouldn't that be a shame, you know? So anyway, so that's what I've done here. And, you know, this is the kind of project where if I were really you know, thought this was cool and it made sense and I wanted to display it, I would probably go back through and aesthetically address um, the images a little better as far as style goes and things like that. But you know, they're documentary at this point. Um, there's a little bit of sense of composition, but I promise I did not premeditate this at all. This was, I picked up the camera while I was cooking. This was all one take. So anyway, that's not the point. The point is, is it, is it successful in telling a story? I think it is for the most part. I'll analyze my own work here, but um, I think that the second image, it, because everything else is so big in scale, like, you know, they're, they're almost not really macros, but close-ups of this egg or eggs and even the phone as the timer, that one shot is a little odd being out of place there. And that may or may not be a big deal, but maybe one thing I would want to do is actually, um, you know, go back through and, and retake that. Um, I don't know that the eggs need to be in the background of the boiling water, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe too much to read and maybe that's more appropriate and then technique I'll talk about in a second but anyway as you go along and also the final shot of the crushed eggshells I'm not sure that's important either that's more of um, you know more of an artistic addition or an aesthetic addiction addiction aesthetic addition if you know what I mean um, so anyway but the rest of them I mean you could probably boil <laughs> no pun intended sorry you could probably boil this down to uh, instead of nine images seven images um, retake the one and be eight images so anyway but that's my point is 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 you know are we telling a story here and I'll go ahead and blow these up so you can see them in sequence too which gives a different effect so we have the eggs here um, you know pre-cooked and here we have boiling water with eggs in the background with a really terrible shot uh, the iPhone set to four minutes um, maybe an egg timer would give a little bit cooler vibe to this or something I don't know uh, eggs being boiled or coming out of the boil uh, rinsing cooling down and finally where to break the egg and then once it's peeled how to get the spoon in there eggs on the toast and uh, there's the crushed eggshells. So anyway, my point being is that what I've done here is I've, I've selected nine images that, um, you know, I've attempted to tell a story with. So anyway, let me get this back over to the video now and uh, let's see what we got here. So this computer kind of behaves strangely. Uh, I need the cam twist. Sorry about the, this is the definitive lo-fi production here. All right, I think we're back on, but we're on FaceTime, sorry. All right. There we go. Okay, so you see what I'm doing here is we're, we're doing storytelling. So you could, you could pick 
a variety of subjects for something like this. So for instance, you could pick, I just happen to do making an egg. You could do all kinds of cooking ideas um, where basically what you want to do, in fact, it might be more interesting to make it challenging. So you're describing only in pictures with no words how to cook something that's more complicated. Soft boiled eggs pretty easy, so it lends itself well to this very easily. Um, <clears throat> whereas, you know, making a bolognese is different. And, you know, how do you deal with measurements and things like that? And how do you do it in a creative way? Now, I think, one thing that's interesting too about what we're doing today is this really has a practical application in the real world as well. A lot of the things that we've done in these episodes up to this point are exercises for yourself. So they're going to do things like work on, you know, um, you know, how your mind works and getting better at something, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas this kind of exercise really is applicable because people who shoot editorial work for magazines deal with this. A lot of times you're hired to do a story um, that would deal with a sequence of images where you're, you're you're illustrating what is being said in the text, if it's a magazine, for instance. Um, and what we're going to do actually is go through and, and you're doing that without the text, you know, but it's supplemental to the text. But what we're doing is taking text out completely on this and we're trying to tell the most important story we can or the most detailed story we can without using words and something like this. So the next step I would do is, is you know, obviously like what I did, I didn't show you all 30 that I originally took and some of them were double takes, making sure the, you know, light was right and you know whatever um, focus was correct um, but I had other steps to this too like I mentioned the toast being pulled out so what I would do is is, is when you when you pick kind of what you're trying to communicate and you go ahead and shoot a bunch of pictures is to go back through and edit those down so what you're gonna do is take away non-essential shots and you can see like I said those crushed eggs at the end were probably not essential that would be one I would take out um, especially if you're paring down from you know 30 images that's a lot to have in a set perhaps and so maybe what you would want to do is see if you can cull some of that out in kind of a minimalist sensibility um, to where you're actually uh, trying to say the most with the least amount of pictures okay so uh, you know you would pull that down and I think what would be interesting too is to go back and see if you can do it with even fewer images than that think of what uh, maybe there's a different image that could kill two steps in one something like that um, you know there's a lot of different things you could do and then finally I think the ultimate is to see if you can't tell a story with one image which is really what we're going for with all this um, and I think that as photographers you know we are visual communicators and we are storytellers uh, in a sense uh, and that can be argued, especially with contemporary aesthetics where you're probably doing something that's more abstract or avant-garde. But in general though, and I think even if you are dealing with something abstract or avant-garde, even though what I was doing was very non-abstract, um, it was cooking an egg, if I was doing something abstract, there's still, remember the very first episode of the masterclass that we're on now that we did, we were talking about um, making sure that uh, well, not making sure, we were talking about the definition of art and we were talking about uh, the point of doing something that is art is to interact somehow and to get a reaction from the viewer, okay? That could be argued because I think in the 20th century you could say, well, maybe there's art that exists to get no reaction at all, but and sure, okay, whatever. But most of it is, is trying to get something from your viewer. And whether that is a positive uh, reaction, whether that's a negative reaction, uh, whether you're trying to make somebody angry, make them think, make them sad, uh, or it's something that's supposed to make people feel good, or maybe it's not an emotion, it's something that's just telling somebody something. And I think those are all part of it. And that's what we're doing here. So we're starting with a sequence of images and we're going to reduce these down as much as possible to the fewest amount of images. And I think the, the gestalt, uh, so to speak, would be getting it down to one image. Um, specifically. So if anybody has any questions, I'm going to open up the chat room and we'll, we'll talk here. Um, there's some photographers who have done this very well. Um, the, the guy that comes to mind, um, who I think is, is really good at this is a photographer from New York named Dwayne Michaels and Dwayne he has been around a long time. Uh, he did uh, a series of, well, he uh, went a series, but he, he did, uh, he kind of became famous in the 80s for a bunch of the album covers that he did. And the one I think that was probably the one that stands out the most to me, and I think it's brilliant, is if you guys are old enough to remember the 80s and anybody had the Police album Synchronicity, which is a genius record, um, I'll just go ahead and say. But uh, Dwayne had done the photos on the cover of that, and I don't have a picture of it in front of me, but the, the, the cover, just Google it, Synchronicity by the Police, uh, it had, um, <coughs> pardon me, it had um, 
like three colored stripes. It was a red, a blue, and a yellow. And then inside each one of the stripes, there were black and white photos of the different band members uh, doing weird things like staying and sitting there with a skeleton in a doctor's office or something. Anyway, very cool stuff. And uh, um, anyway, really cool. Uh, Let's see, uh, Vargas Miguel, sorry, I can't read some of these names sometimes on the fly. Uh, I'll address your question in just a second. Um, I want to say one more thing about Dwayne Michaels. Dwayne is interesting because he has done, and I've seen him speak before, and you can find books of his, and I, I'll look them up on Amazon and I'll put something in the notes here. Uh, but Dwayne has some exceptional work that he's done where he's done this storytelling technique. Um, he's done it in different ways with, obviously he's really good at telling a story with a single image. Uh, he's done things with double exposure that are really interesting, and he's done image series. And the series stuff is interesting to me. And I remember the one I saw had, I think it was Richard Greer, Richard Gere and Cindy Crawford in it. And if this is, I mean, this was probably 10 years ago. So pardon me if memory's not serving correctly, but he kind of had this story that he was telling um, that had to do with them as a couple and walking down the street and holding hands, kissing or whatever, or getting in an argument or I don't remember what it was specifically, but it was a really interesting use of storytelling through multiple images. Now, when you have celebrity friends, it makes it a lot more fun, and most of us don't. Um, but you could you could grab two people that you know and try and set a scene up like uh, like you would have in a movie, and and actually go through the same exercise and shoot like that. I think that would be uh, that would be very cool. Bob K says, "Think Grandma Moses with a camera." Another view. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I think there's a lot of photographers who have done this really well. And and don't when you're when you're looking for sources of inspiration, don't limit yourself just to photography. Uh, in fact, I would go look at mediums that do this kind of thing on a regular basis, like uh, you know some of the people who do comic books that are that are essential to the you know aesthetic of our 20th century. Uh, comic books deal with that; they're in pains and they tell a story, and it's with image. Um, I think that's a really great source of inspiration. Uh, fine art is another one. Um, there's one I was thinking of. Oh well, film obviously. Um, you know, go look at directors. And I'll give you a few names here of people that I'm very influenced by. Uh, Werner Herzog, who's a, a very well-known German um, director. The reason I mention him is because he really just has this beautiful eye for composition. Um, he has a feel. It's almost like he's a photographer that's shooting motion, really, to me. Um, he has a wonderful uh, sense of storytelling involved. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, from an artistic standpoint, there's a lot of film directors who direct wonderful films, but, but Werner Herzog does really beautiful work, and I think photographers would find interest in there. Fellini's another one. Uh, just absolutely beautiful cinematography. Um, each shot is so well composed. Um, they're like moving pictures. <laughs> you know, they are moving pictures, but, but they're like moving stills is what, how these guys kind of address that. And there's a ton more. I mean, there's, there's some little one-off movies that are wonderful. One I saw last week is a movie called In Bruges, which is a kind of violent comedy about these, uh, these two guys who've committed a murder and the, their boss tells them to go hang out in the city of Bruges, which is in Belgium. And it beautifully, beautifully, beautifully shot movie. Um, you know, where each scene, you can tell there was a considerable, uh, you know, attention pay, paid to storytelling and storyboarding within this. So anyway, good stuff. So anyway, I would, I would definitely go stretch out and look at some other mediums in addition to photography. And, you know, with photography, I, I can only think of probably a handful of people who've done this type of storytelling. Um, if you're talking about narrowing all, this all the way down to one image to tell a story. Definitely photographers who I've been talking about over and over and over again uh, on this show um, and in the series. Um, you know, definitely guys like I think Avalotta Morel, who's one of my favorites who's alive and, and photographing today. Um, I think he has a, a wonderful way of communicating or telling a story using one image only. Um, he narrows it down to that. Uh, there's a lot of images that, you know, in the book, and, and if, well, here I can show them to you, um, that, you know, let's see, here it is. I mentioned because he's a photography teacher, there were a lot of pho photographic phenomenon that he was uh, illustrating for his classes that he was teaching. You know, this is the famous one here. Bring it back. And they're just beautiful shots. I mean, you know, what he's illustrating is how a lens works, okay? And so you can see the light bulb. Uh, I hope everybody can see it. I've got two cameras to work with. You see the light bulb in the, the camera obscure, the dark box, with a lens attached and how the light bulb is projected upside down on the back wall. And, you know, he's telling the story, but it's such a beautiful aesthetic in this shot. It's not just a snapshot like what I just showed you that I did this morning. I mean, this was a well thought out, um, beautifully composed and lit shot. Very simple, but very elegant, and it, it does tell a story. I even think that he does, um, you know, a good job of that. For instance, in these camera obscura photos that he does, 
where basically what he does is this is a hotel room above Times Square, uh, covers the windows with uh, probably hefty trash bags or something like that to block out all the light, cuts a pinhole in the middle, and this image gets projected on the wall. Well, it's just a simple technique, but this really communicates not so much a literal story, but I think it the, captures the mood of Times Square extremely well. You know, um, the activity, the, the noise, the, the just the stuff that's going on. Um, and, you know, I think on the opposite end, there's some scenes in here where it's very pastoral and very simple. Um, speaking of storytelling, I, I showed these in the last one, but there's these images of books that he's done, uh, these children's books where he's cut them up. Here's Alice in Wonderland. These are a few scenes from this. And here's telling a story with one image, you know. That is, I think I'm showing you the, yeah, that's Alice looking up at a tree, and the book is folded in half to show the tree in three-dimensional form. Um, on the other side, there's the Queen of Hearts, who's been cut out of the book. So, anyway, just absolutely stunning stuff. Even this one, is, I mean, I don't know if this tells a story more than sets a mood, but this is just showing the optical illusion of, of what happens through eyeglasses. And uh, that's a self-portrait of Mr. Morell. And uh, anyway, so I, you know, I think he's really good at that. I think uh, even more pointed towards this are some of the guys I've showed you, like Henri Cartier-Bresson, uh, the French photographer, um, uh, guys like uh, like Kappa. I'm trying to think, like classic photojournalists, I think, are really good at this. I think there's some people like Richard Avedon, uh, and I did an art of photography podcast on Richard Avedon a while back. And Avedon is an incredible photographer, um, was, he's deceased now, um, a huge inspiration to me. And I think he did a wonderful job of storytelling. My favorite work of his, um, he's known for kind of these minimalist contemporary works he did for some mu a museum in the, um, oh gosh, probably about the 80s. But his work from the 60s and 70s where he was doing fashion work, um, and I talk about this in that podcast, that at the time, there was a real set style for shooting fashion. Um, the models always look very serious. I mean, you still see this now, um, but in kind of an abstract way, but, but there was a, a definite mode of how it was being done at the time. We find this image. Oh, well, there's a bunch of them in here, and I've showed these in the podcast, um, but like just a simple thing like this. I think this is a perfect way to illustrate it right here. Okay, this is an image, a uh, fashion image. I didn't look at the caption, probably shot for a magazine. Let's see what it says. It doesn't say, but uh, this was probably shot for an ad or a story or something. And it's a couple sitting over drinks. The woman's turned around, the man's looking at her neck, and she's, something's caught her attention. And this completely tells a story. It's with one image, okay? And, uh, I think it's it's just simply stunning. He didn't always do that. I think this is another one with these these circus elephants. Um, so it's a huge book. But you know, obviously the compositions involved with the line in her arm and the way she's juxtaposed with the elephants, the shallow depth of field, um, the elephants begin to blur a little bit. Uh, it's just you know, I think genius stuff. I wish I had a Dwayne Michaels book, and we can do a recap. In fact, he would make a really good. Uh, um, subject for an art of photography episode just on on his work uh, but Dwayne Michaels has actually done the series work that I'm talking about where you have um, seven images or ten images that, that comprise and tell a story um, there's there's some other pieces that I've seen too and actually I should bring this up too before we, uh, before we close out on the topic but um, I think uh, to make another music analogy uh, and you see this particularly in drawing a lot, I think for visual medium comparison, um, in fine art, uh, particularly with sketching, things like that. But there's an idea in music that's existed for years and years. Uh, Bach used to compose this way. It's an idea called theme and variation. Okay, so in a theme and variation, uh, as Bach would, would compose it, is that you have a simple melody or a musical idea of some kind, or sometimes it can be a rhythmic pattern. Anyway, some audible concept and you write a series of pieces based around that theme so it's a theme and variation so for instance if you listen to something like the Goldberg variations which was a keyboard piece that was written and there's a ton of variations on this uh, 32 variations I believe and so the first theme is echoed in the last so it kind of brings itself together uh, in a musical composition and in the middle, the tempos change, the keys change, the, uh, the, 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 the scales that the, they're composed around major or minor, I'm trying not to get too much into this, they change. And so it's like this, this 32 little short pieces completely exploiting all the possibilities, or 32 possibilities, 
of a particular musical theme. And so I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, and so, you know, what you can kind of think of as something like that is a theme in variations. This breaks away from the story concept we were talking about a little bit, but, uh, and may, maybe ties this in a little more with the uh, photographic meditation thing we were talking about a couple weeks ago. But, Anyway, but that's the idea. So, for instance, um, you know, uh, and I wish I could remember the name of the photographer. It was a piece that's up right now at Tate Britain that I saw when I was over there. <clears throat> and it's this beautiful piece. It's on my phone, which I have no idea where that is. Um, it's this beautiful piece. It's, it's probably... <clears throat> it's probably something like 30 or 40 images that are, you know, the, it's oh, probably the size of one of these, but, but you know, horizontal. And they're all lined up. And it's, it's a, uh, a dancer who is dressed in black on this white chair with a white background doing all these image poses. And so it kind of has this echo back to figure drawing where, once again, it's a theme and variations, exhausting all the possibilities of the model posing on this chair in, in this black turtleneck and pants. And, and it was really striking because of the high contrast with the black clothes with the white background. Um, and what you really start to see is this figure against a background. So I think that was executed extremely well. Um, I'll put it in the notes. I can't remember the artist's name right now. So um, anyway, a photographer's name in that case. But, uh, you know, theme and variations is another thing to explore. You know, maybe, um, I'm trying to think. <clears throat> For instance, I, I, here's a good one. Um, maybe if you were to, if you're a landscape photographer, and this is a big project, this would take a while to do, but you have some kind of landscape you're shooting, so it's either outdoors in the country, or maybe it's a city urban landscape kind of thing, uh, and you go shoot it at you know, the variations, it's like from one angle, but all the variations become like the same weather or different weather conditions, different times of the day. It would take a long time to do and it'd be really hard to get precise and keep all these identical looking. So, you know, the end result is if you'd never moved the camera, um, you're simply shooting a theme and variations. The theme being the scene that, that you have there and the variations being times of day, uh, lighting conditions, weather conditions, all those kinds of things. And being able to see all those as a set, I think that that would be kind of interesting. Um, there's a contemporary artist, Olafur Eliasson, who, uh, or Eliasson, I can't remember how to say it, um, from Europe, who, who does some interesting stuff. He does kind of these techie science type projects with lights and motors and, and prisms and wonderful stuff like that. But he also does photography a little bit. And he has these pieces that are themes and variations on landscapes like that. Uh, a bunch of them were shot in Iceland. He's got this real affinity with Iceland that he likes to communicate a lot. And so a lot of the photos, um, you know, are of that nature. So anyway, so themes and variations, storytelling, all those kinds of things. Anybody got any questions on this? Um, I kind of want to say a few things to wrap up all the episodes that we've talked about because this will be the last Masterclass Live on this particular series. Um, I don't know. I, I, it seems like the guys I'm seeing in the chat room have joined us every time. And I, I know the time may be not good for some people, good for others. It, give me some feedback if you've got something on that. I mean, I'm flexible. It's noon here, so I can I can move around. Actually, it's one now. But uh, anyways... Um, but to kind of recap what we've talked about all you know a lot of these things they're just exercises that you're going to do that hopefully will lead to better uh i don't know uh the lead to different things you want me to do the enclosing next week i can if you want um if it's getting too late for John Doe 87, I certainly understand, or you could watch it on YouTube. Um, but what we've done here in this series of episodes is we have kind of taken some ideas to try to make yourself think differently, do different things to improve your sensibility as a photographer, to improve your style, to make it more personal. And um, it is scheduled for next week, but I'm gonna do film next week. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, we could back it up today, unless anybody has anything they want to share for next week or anything like that. Um, let me wrap it up in closing right now, and we can kind of address that, um, you know, when we when we get there. But anyway, okay. So what we've done is we've done a series of exercises. We've done. Uh, um, uh, you know, it, it's a series of meditations, if you will, to try to make you think differently as a photographer. And a lot of people think, think about developing your personal style. It has nothing to do, this is the same old stuff I always say, it has nothing to do with lenses, it has nothing to do with cameras, it has nothing to do with equipment. You need to have them, obviously, to make a photograph, but you don't need to sit there and pine over having the latest and greatest whatever, because that's not the important thing. The important thing to remember and to take away from this entire series is this, is that photographs are not made with your equipment or the camera doesn't make photos you make photos okay the camera doesn't take pictures you take the pictures and that's the hard part it's the hard part about anything and that's why so few people do it and i think that's why so many podcasts so many youtube videos all these things that you see tend to dwell a lot on equipment 
based ideas specifically. Uh, they'll talk about equipment reviews and gear and what you can do and how to do. And there are techniques involved with equipment and I obviously talked about you know some stuff I'll do in the future with that. But it's really important not to let uh, basically the millions of dollars of marketing spent by two large Japanese camera manufacturers dictate what you do as a photographer. I mean, that's great. Everybody has, um, everybody has moments in your life and, and those of us that are older in here we all can understand that you go through periods where you have extra money all the time and you can kind of spend money and buy lavish things and you go through times that are quite lean. It is always cyclic. and. It can be frustrating if you feel like you need to have the latest wide angle Canon lens or whatever it is, the version two of this, you know. And, and if, there are times where you'll be able to do that, but don't ever like waste all your time thinking about that because, you know, it comes in and out. Uh, you know, like, like Mark is saying right now, the right tools in a master craftsman's hands can make a difference. He'll do great things with the wrong tools if he has to. That, I, Mark, that's a quote. I mean, that's, that's brilliant. That, that, I think that says it all. Uh, and that's what we all are striving to do as photographers. If you weren't interested in getting better, one, you wouldn't be watching me definitely at this point in the podcast talking about it. Um, and you would also, uh, uh, I don't think you would shoot a lot of photos. <laughs> and there are people who do that. They collect cameras and collect lenses. If you go to these camera shows, there's a lot of collectors there. They'll never take a single shot on those. They, there's something obsessive about the decorative art aspect of this object that makes photos and that's okay too but that's not what we're here doing um, like I said particularly if you're still with me at this point point. Uh, and so we're all aiming to get better and I think that's what's important um, to say one thing about equipment though I think it's really important uh, as a photographer to learn the equipment that you've got and let me talk about what I'm talking about with that obviously reading the manual and stuff but I, I found, and I'm like probably everybody else, especially in my younger days, I used to, especially when I'd travel, I'd pack a whole bag full of cameras and I wouldn't even use some of them. And I'd spend more time fooling around with what lens I was going to bring with me and, and doing that kind of thing than I would actually taking pictures. Of course, that ended and I got more serious about it. Um, but even then, I, I found that if I switched equipment too much, and it's fun to do because, I mean, you know, that's what, what, what they, you know, uh, like I said, the two large Japanese camera manufacturers, you know, want you to, to be into buying a lot of equipment. Um, but I found that if I switch around, like for instance, if I'm using a lens that I'm not used to using, when you're in the heat of the battle of actually on the photo shoot, particularly if it involves other people, there's a lot of distractions. So if you're doing people shots, if you're doing, um, if you're shooting uh, professionally, you have a client standing there watching what you're doing. There's so many things to get your mind around. And I found like little things like not understanding completely how the autofocus works or not remembering to have set on a digital camera whether I'm I'm in raw or whether I'm shooting JPEGs. Little things like that can just kill you, you know? And I think it's really important, not so much to spend a lot of time with your camera manual, but to be constantly shooting with the same equipment. And that even goes for film photography. I used to, when I got into that, I, you know, it's real fun to go buy a bunch of developers and a bunch of different kinds of film and you mix and match and you're having fun with all that. But when you start getting serious about it, it's like what we're talking about here. You need to minimize what you're using. And that way, when you're in the heat of the battle, when you're out there, when you're actually on a photo shoot and you're doing it, you know your stuff inside out and it's like an extension of yourself and that way that gets your mind off of that and it gets it on to making great images which is what we're all setting out to do and so you know there's a lot of things that comprise that so you know whatever camera you have now use it and treat it with respect uh, like mark was saying there was a nine-year-old at the photography meetup and she was she was making these goofy images where she was painting a face on her finger and shooting them against backgrounds and stuff and it was cute but and you see that with kids a lot because they're not um, censoring their own thoughts like adults are like I would never do that because everybody here is going to think I'm a lunatic you know and so it's cute to see kids do that and it's important to kind of kind of break down some of those walls and they, they, I mean this could lead to a whole another series of podcasts and kind of you know this methodology that we're talking about which is too much for what we're trying to do today and maybe we can revisit this in the future but you know what we've done here is we've established uh, a series of four lessons with, over an hour long each uh, with uh, you know some exercises to do and these are supposed to try to train your brain to think a little better okay and so that's that's what we're going for here and I found and I've said this before in these and I don't know if you remember but um, I found that personally 
it's like working out and you know part of the deal and i will be the first to admit that right now i have been not working out enough and probably eating too much and that needs to happen again and right now one of the things that i'm experiencing is the lack of motivation to actually get out there and start getting exercise and i promise i'm going to make myself start doing it very soon but you know it's easy to make excuses for being busy whatever the real reason i don't want to get out there and work out is because it's hard i'm going to get out there i'm going to go jogging i'll get a quarter of a mile i'll be winded i'll be dead tired and i'll come home because I'm out of shape. And I think your brain works the same way, uh, especially when you're doing creative type work like what we're talking about here. When you're doing creative work, um, you, it's like a muscle. It needs to expand. It needs to, uh, you, you need to be doing it a lot. Uh, Vargas Miguel says, I've been, think, I've been like that for the past month. I don't know whether you're talking about exercise or, or getting into the spirit of photos, but, but I think that, that's important. And, and I found that particularly if you're doing this for a living, Okay, let's say this, um, which I do. It, it, it's sometimes if I haven't been exercising creatively, I'll be in a situation and I find it particularly showing itself when there's other people involved. So if I'm with a group of people and we're trying to brainstorm topics for something or we're trying to figure out what we're gonna shoot or what it's gonna be and I have other people that are having input on that, if I haven't done it in a while, I'm almost embarrassed because it starts making me feel like, gosh, I, I just, I can't get my mind around it, particularly around somebody who is really creative minded and, and really good at new ideas on the fly and fresh stuff. But I found that if you can keep these things up, that's what it takes. And so the next time you're feeling flat or you're feeling like, you know, I think what inspired this thing to begin with is, uh, you know, not having or, or feeling like you don't have a personal style as a photographer. And it's really easy to do. Uh, it's hard to have a personal style as a photographer because you're not drawing or anything. You're interpreting something literally out of a camera. Um, it's really hard to draw that out. And uh, that's where all this stuff comes in. And that's why you're making yourself think. You're, you're pushing yourself. You're thinking, you know, uh, you're exhausting the possibilities in your mind. Um, you'll find sometimes your mind is on a different track. And when you finally execute something that you're going to consider a work of art or a job for a client or whatever it is, sometimes they don't always come out like you envision in your head and maybe for some people they don't ever come out like they envision in their head but that's at least moving you in the right direction and if somebody's not in your head they don't know those things but uh, but that's what you're shooting for is, is 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 trying to close that gap between what's in your head and 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 what you're doing with your work and that's really important to remember um you know uh Anyway, all that being said, I think that is probably a good place to wrap all this up. Unless you guys have any, I think now is the time. If you have any questions or anything, we have one more week on the schedule for this. And I would be happy to use that talking about developing your style as a photographer if you guys are so interested. Um, when I originally did all my outlines for these, um, I obviously had a lot to say with the first batch of them. And then I think I was giving a week for each idea on the later ones. So, uh, Bob K, thank you for joining us. Got a split, looking forward to film. Absolutely, we will, we will go over all kinds of things. It will be all things film will be the next topic. So I'm starting the YouTube archive of this a little bit later than I am. Um, we talked before I turned the camera on, basically is what I'm trying to say. So film is going to be the next topic we're gonna to do for Masterclass Live. Um, it's gonna be a lot less meta and a lot less heady than this was. It's gonna be more practical um, with some examples and stuff and I think uh, the reason I don't want to do more heady stuff is one for me, they're hard to plan and, and, and um, you know, outline and do a curriculum for, but I think for you guys too, I think this will give you some chance to digest some of this stuff. Uh, you know, watch these in the archive. Um, I've tried to create a series of, of lessons and exercises that are kind of timeless in a sense. So um, you can revisit them anytime you want. In fact, I'll be honest, some of these are kind of, uh, Oh gosh, they're really old, probably like 20, 25 years old. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you how old I am. When I was in high school and I was really getting serious and I thought I was gonna be a guitar player for a living one day and I was really getting into this, um, I went through a lot of this same um, kind of idea of discovery. So, you know, I was really interested in that point of developing my style as a guitar player. You know, I, the guys that I looked up to, you know, the Jimi Hendrix or the jazz guitar players that I liked, you could tell, in fact, let me say this before we close, because I think this is important just to talk about where this came from. But, uh, you know, when I, was, when I was playing guitar, I was young, I was getting going, uh, you know, I looked up to guys like Jimi Hendrix, uh, I like jazz guitar players like Wes Montgomery, uh, Charlie Christian a little bit, uh, and then more contemporary people at that time, like guys like Pat Metheny or Ralph Town or guys like that. And the really good guitar players, even with the rock stuff I was listening to, like I was a big Yes fan, so I listened to Steve Howe. And you could tell Steve Howe with like three notes, you know, he had such a voice 
in a sense, even though he's not singing, he's playing guitar, but, but the, any good musician who has a personal style, and, and it always bothered me that, like, how do I develop that? And I don't know that I ever did musically, um, and as I grew up, I ended up in a different profession and all that, but it's something that's carried with me on into my own work as a photographer, uh, particularly when you're dealing with art, and I've always wanted to be able to have kind of a style to myself where if somebody saw an image they could say hey yeah that's Ted Forbes or whatever and I'm definitely not at that point um, but you know a lot of these things are, are research that I'd done back when I was music and they've been repurposed into the four episodes that we've done here into a visual medium um, and they're a little bit far out but you know I think they're really important I think they get you thinking and that really I can't say it enough what well, we're, we're, we're photographers but we're really thinkers with a camera and uh, you know that's the takeaway here and that's what you want want to uh, want to think about what's interesting though is, is since I've been working in an art museum for four years um, you know particularly with contemporary art when you get into contemporary artists um, not so much photographers but visual artists and you get into the really weird far out stuff there are guys out there that their thing is having no style at all and what's interesting is like this kind of comes back around to itself because I think in having no style at all you still have a style it's having no style at all um, but there are guys that, that kind of do shows every now and then and nothing ever looks the same and it's all conceptual but even those guys I mean I know they're arguing that they they're anti-style and they're anti, you know, aesthetic or anti look, but that has become their thing, even at that. And so I think that's perfectly plausible to do. And I still don't see why the stuff we've talked about here wouldn't help you expand your mind with whatever it is you're trying to do, with whatever you're trying to communicate. Uh, some people are going to be comfortable with these kinds of things. Some people won't. I mean, that's just kind of how it is. And uh, anyway, I hope you guys have all found this useful. Um, I haven't been looking at the chat. Sorry. Uh, Mark says, thanks again, Ted. This has really kicked me up a gear with my photography. I hope so, Mark. And thanks. It was good to meet you at the meetup last week. Um, uh, and we'll do more of this in the future. I'm not done. I'm not finished, I say. Um, I, I think this was really good. This is something that I've tried to do a little bit with the art of photography shows that I've done. And they're just too short to really do that with. Uh, they're 15 minutes. I can say a few things. We can get into a few ideas and stuff. But, you know, it's so funny. I mean, they're, they're kind of like the two-minute photo tips, you know, in, in a way, even though they're 15 or 20. But it's still really talking about one thing, and it's really hard. And I thought it would really be good with these master classes. And I'm still working out kinks here, obviously, with using two cameras. And I had a computer die and blah, blah, blah. And so they're not the most professional things you've ever seen, I know. Um, but we'll get better at that as time goes by, too, just like we will get better at being photographers. Um, so it's important. Yeah, John, thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, Mark says, I think sometimes applying something from one dis discipline to another can really open up possibilities. Absolutely. In fact, I think, um, you know, I, I don't think I, I have a music degree, actually. And I wouldn't have, I mean, sometimes I miss not having uh, studied photography more formally. Um, but I've done enough of it on my own. I don't know that I would have needed that. In fact, I almost prefer the way it's worked out where I've had that exposure to different disciplines. And, and even film, too, because I do a lot of video work. That's what my day job mo mostly comprises of is, is, is doing film work. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's real close to photography, but it's another dimension that you're adding into this time element and motion and all these other things. But... but uh, I, I, I like staying versatile and I like not that I'm great at it, but that's kind of my thing is I let all these things influence each other. And that's, that's what, that's what I enjoy. It keeps things interesting for me. Um, so anyway, so anyway, thank you so much guys. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the camera now. Thanks for joining. This has been the masterclass live series on developing your style as a photographer. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the YouTube feed. If you guys want to hang out in the chat room for a little bit, I have some time. Um, but thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And join us on the next one where we're going to actually uh, change our topic and we're going to do a series of uh, master classes on film. And so I've got to start planning those. So we'll start those actually next week uh, since we wrap this up today.